Hi, everyone, and welcome to our second Wild Washington uh, live video. Today, uh, my name is Leah Althauser, and I am our Environmental Education Coordinator for Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I'm so very excited to introduce uh, Officer Courtney Nassett, who is stationed out of Ellensburg. Officer Nassett uh, graduated with her degree in law and justice from Central Washington University in 2013. And she is uh, gonna talk to you today about sort of the different roles that uh, fish and wildlife officers play depending on where they're stationed in the region, um, how you can become a fish and wildlife officer, maybe some skills and um, education you might need and uh, just some highlights and perks of the job. So thank you so much, Courtney, for being with us today. Thank you, Leah, for having me. Um, so I guess I'll start off by uh, showing you guys a presentation that we've come up with or for Fish and Wildlife to kind of show you um, what we're kind of all about. And if I can figure out my PowerPoint, uh, we'll get started. Um, so like Leah said, my name is Officer Courtney Nassett. I've been with the department for almost five years uh, this upcoming year, and it's truly been one of the greatest jobs in the world I could ever ask for. It's completely different, I think, from any other law enforcement and just mostly because we focus on natural resource protection. Um, and this presentation will kind of get into it and then we'll have some Q and A's. Um, so our role um, as far as Fish and Wildlife Police Officers is to serve the public by providing professional natural resource law enforcement, protecting public safety, responding to emergency situations, and building partnerships within our communities. And I can say, as far as with being in Kittitas County, it's very close knit and you learn uh, a lot of the different areas and meet a lot of the same people and kind of get to interact with the same people, see how their lives are going, and then have that more building relationship within your community. Um, so as far as fish and wildlife officers go, we have 42.6 million acres in Washington state and 147 WDFW police officers. Um, so you can kind of see on the map how we're pretty spread out. Um, within my county itself, we have three officers and one sergeant. Um, and you kind of get more spread out and it makes for a lot of enjoyment. Uh, here in our county, we have a lot of public land, um, whether it's Forest Service, Department of Natural Resources or Fish and Wildlife or any other public land, as well as some uh, private land contracts. We have, we have quite a bit to patrol and to make sure everything's being managed. Um, so we're spread out, as you can see, it's more heavily concentrated on the west side. Um, there's a lot more population on the west side of the state compared to on the east side, um, and we're a little bit more spread out. So this is kind of how we're structured as far as um, the different regions. So we have six regions, and it's you can kind of see here spread out over the map. Our headquarters are located in Olympia, and um, where it says Yakima and Kittitas County, it's actually 17 and 18. Uh, we had a split from Yakima County about two, three years ago um, when they had put a, put a sergeant here for us. Um, and that's just because we have so much going on in our own county that it was a little bit difficult to go down to Yakima County as well. Um, so here's some pictures of uh, kind of what I've been able to do in five years. Um, obviously, it, there's a sturgeon that's as big as me, and there's, you know, a lot of the times uh, there's bigger ones than that. Um, the picture there on the right is of me trying sea urchin for the first time when I was up in Anacortes for career building. And, um, you know, I, I grew up with the love of the outdoors. I grew up hunting with my dad from the day I could walk. And that's what drove my passion for getting into uh, natural resource protection. And I got into college, knew I wanted to go into law enforcement. And after having a prior experience with a um, game warden or fish and wildlife officer, as we 
kind of change out the words. Um, it was a good interaction. And, you know, I had that memory and had been seeing Rugged Justice on the TV back when it was on and was like, you know what, that that's what I want to do. Like, I want to be able to protect the natural resources for future generations to be able to enjoy. Um, you know, I got that opportunity. I didn't go fishing as much as I wanted to, or as I really did um, growing up. That's just not really what my dad did. And so hunting was what I got into and that's what drove this passion. Um, so a few more pictures of me. So part of being with Fish and Wildlife, we do have a lot of equipment choices. Um, the snowmobile pictures from Trout Lake a few years or a couple years ago for snowmobile training with the Forest Service. And it's just the opportunities to be able to use different equipment. I mean, obviously for snowmobiles here in Kittitas County, we're full of snow during the winter and we go and check snowmobile registrations, make sure people are being safe. And ultimately just, it, it's a blast. I mean, it is work and we do, you know, write tickets and stuff, but it is a lot of fun and a good time. Um, one of the other things we have there is a UTV. Um, with that, we also have tracks for it. And so we can go in the snow. Um, that's up on our uh, LT Murray Wildlife Area doing a spring patrol. I was with uh, Officer Corey Peterson, who is one of my co-workers here in Kittitas County. Um, the other, the last picture there is of me helping to release uh, bighorn sheep. Uh, it's about the first time I came into the county uh, when I got assigned here after field training. And it was pretty cool. We captured some bighorn sheep over on Clemens Mountain and relocated them over to the Quillamine Bay area to produce, to change the genetics up and uh, make sure we have a healthy population there. So kind of the other things that we have is uh, there are some horses, um, boats. We've been up in, uh, up in helicopters. We've got big boats over on the coast, ATVs. Um, I feel like I'm missing some things and I could be, I mean, we have tr uh, pickup trucks that we are pretty much our offices all the time. Um, there in the middle, we have a, a marijuana eradication team. And so they go looking at grows and stuff that are often found on wildlife areas sometimes. Um, so the need. So Fish and Wildlife Police, we provide a wide array of services uh, that benefits the quality of life in Washington State. Our, this is kind of just a brief overview of what we do. So it's protecting our natural species and our habitat, responding to dangerous human wildlife conflicts, enhancing public safety outdoors, and addressing uh, illegal trafficking on a global scale. So protecting species, uh, you know, obviously we have to, you know, the elk gets caught up in the net. We have to help tranquilize it and get the net off so it can live its life and not be impeded by that. Um, in the middle, we have Officer Wessel who found a false bottom for a guy over limiting on shrimp. Uh, and that's just on, you know, that is fishing through like a cooler that doesn't look right and you, you know, it feels heavy, but, and there's something quite off about it. You know, the officer was able to use her skills and, you know, found the false bottom and uh, the over limit of shrimp. And then obviously, you know, we manage shrimp for a region, reason, there's limitations. Um, that way everybody can have shrimp and we, our populations are sustainable. Um, and then we have, you know, picking up the little owl on the side of the road if it's injured and taking it to a rehab facility. Um, so protecting our habitat, um, obviously going down and trying to get crab pots um, so they're not, you know, continuing to capture crabs. Um, you know, that's why we enforce the rock cord and everything like that is so that if traps do get lost, they you know, we're not killing multiple crabs and losing that population. 
Um, like I said, the marijuana eradication team takes from the habitat as far as water, you know, soil brings in a lot of the pollution into our streams. Um, timber theft, um, sometimes a lot of these are green trees, which are habitat for uh, our native species. And then litter as a lot of our issue too is people for some reason just don't seem to really care that it's public land and they're like, well, we wanna get rid of our stuff and here it all goes. And they don't care if you know it looks bad or if it's dangerous to bringing in wild animals or even other potentially dangerous things that are in that garbage. Um, so human wildlife conflict resolution. We deal, I know in Kittitas County, bears and cougars are probably our um, number one kind of thing, depending on the season. And so obviously we get the bears that come in for the bird seed or the garbage. And oftentimes we're dealing with that. Um, please don't ever feed bears. It's not, it doesn't end up good. And that's one of the things we have to try to educate people on is, you know, they may see it as just a, you know, well, they're hungry, they're coming out of hibernation, but it's, it's better when they get their own natural food source and don't have to um, go to us for food, like dog food and stuff like that. It's just a bad situation. And oftentimes it leads to worse things like having to euthanize the animal. And in the beginning, it's not really the animal's fault. Um, so here is actually a couple pictures of traps that we've used in our county. Um, so one was a cougar trap right there. And um, it had killed a pet goat and dragged it off. And um, so we have to come out and take care of situations like that. The bear picture, uh, the bear actually never ended up going in the trap. It looked at my trap and said, nope, not going in there. It's not tasty enough. And that was at one of our local campgrounds um, that was continually having bear problems and we're having to educate people and talk to campers, which is kind of hard to do when you're having a revolving door of campers and trying to educate people. So that's definitely one of the challenges is um, people want to learn and they want to educate themselves, but going into a situation, situation like that, we have the issue of new people coming in and having to kind of reteach people how to be in bear country. So public safety, um, so we do respond to public safety incidences. We are fully commissioned officers. Um, we go through the basic law enforcement training academy, just like the local PDs do, county. Um, the only one who doesn't go through that same program is state patrol, they have their own academy. Um, so we're fully commissioned with two partial commissions, one's from NOAA and the other one is from US Fish and Wildlife Services. Um, so we respond to, you know, any given thing. I mean, the truck that went down a railroad track and they're trying to recover the truck out of there before the rail, before the train hits it. Um, you know, vehicles getting stuck in mud. You know, we're often in these remote areas by ourselves and we know a lot of the terrain in our area and how to help. And, you know, we become kind of a good resource in the fact that we know the areas that we're patrolling in. And then they're, uh, you know, having to land helicopters in remote areas and trying to get, every, I mean, we are not operating the helicopters, but, you know, getting the helicopter to where they need to be. Uh, more public safety, seafare, um, lot of, a lot of our officers go over for seafare for a lot of the um, boating under the influence stuff. Um, and then kind of that litter that we talked that I talked about earlier is, you know, you have the drug stuff and come in contact with people who do have drugs. I mean, I've contacted people just on camping at an access site they're not allowed to and ending up having that turn into an arrest warrant. And then, you know, both you know, searching the person before going to jail, you know, there's drugs and then you have to deal with that. And it, so one thing can turn into some, some simple thing can turn into something kind of more extreme. Um, so then one of the other things that we've been tasked with is the um, 
uh, the illegal trafficking of wildlife. And um, as you can see, there's the elephant ivory, which came into effect. Um, we have Benny who used to be with us, but no longer is, um, but he was a good resource and having to be him at the Port of Tacoma and sniffing out um, the different shipments that would come in. Um, so we're just really, we go into antique stores too and look for elephant ivory and talk with the different shopkeepers about, hey, can't be selling this anymore unless it's under the certain um, allowances. Um, so some other illegal trafficking stuff. Um, I am pictured there with a bunch of eagles. There are juvenile bald eagles, which are illegal to uh, kill. In that case, a lot of, when I talked to the person, they said, well, the, uh, the juvenile bald eagles feathers resemble golden eagle feathers, which can get a little bit more money. Um, and then we have abalone. So, you know, heavily maintained and regulated stuff or not even, we don't even allow for the harvest of, that's what we're trying to protect. You know, people just trying to, people are trying to make money off of our natural resources and it's our job to protect and make sure that those animals don't die just because somebody wants to make some extra cash. Um, so I'll just talk about a couple of the, or the pictures there, and then we'll go into the Q and A. Um, so the bear in the trap is from last summer. Um, that bear was the largest bear I've, uh, dealt with. It's 353 pounds. Um, the middle one is I helped on tranquilizing a deer that got a rat trap stuck on the bottom of its mouth. Uh, peanut butter was the cause. It just wanted some peanut butter as it's getting colder days and it got a little <laughs> stuck and couldn't get it off. So we immobilized it, immobilized her and got it off of her and made sure she woke back up and rejoined her herd. Um, the meme is just something funny that one of my, uh, one of the DNR officers I've worked with made um, I can tell you at least in the in the woods, I don't care about spiders in my home. Yeah, it, it, that one's a little true. Um, so yeah, so that's all I have for the presentation. Uh, Leah, okay. we wanna go into the Q and A. Oh, you're on mute, Leah. <laughs> Thank you, forgot I had to hit two buttons. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Courtney, and, and for putting that slideshow together. That was awesome. So we do have a few questions for you. Our first one is, can you be a felon and still be a fish and wildlife officer? Um, so going through, so when you go through the uh, application process, um, obviously the background check goes through, and we do have a lot of the disqualification uh Mar like points on our website as far as under fish and wildlife police's um, uh, like page on our on the actual department website you can go under enforcements page and see all the disqualifications I believe it would be but I don't do the background I don't do I don't actually look at a lot of the disqualifications on a daily basis but um, it's always done with a like with the background check, it's always done on a case by case basis. If it it just depends on what it is, um, but most of the time, yes, I would believe felonies are a disqualifier. Thank you, and I'll send that link that she was talking about in the chat in just one second. So, Courtney, how would you say that WDFW police differs between regular law enforcement? Do you feel equipped to deal with hostile po poachers? Yeah, so, I mean, we go through the exact same academy as the, as well, I guess, quote unquote, regular police do. We have a general commission. We have full authority. We go into situations with our local uh, police in order, like if they have something going on and they don't have backup or we're in the area, and they need assistance, we're fully able to go in there and assist them. And one of the things with being a fish and wildlife police officer, when 
I mean, most of the time we are, you know, on our own. We are single vehicles, we're by ourselves. And a lot of the time, what you have to learn is the ability to talk to people and de-escalate situations. I mean, that's probably one of the main things is, you know, a lot of the times, you know, if you have something that you think is going to be even more, then you call a fellow officer or you call for backup. It's just that our backup tends to not be, you know, close by like in regular cities or um, in the, within the county. I mean, even our county deputies out here, are, you know, kind of almost run about the same number we do sometimes, but it's just all about working well with your local law enforcement. I mean, you just have to learn to talk and read people very well and read the situation and go from there. So, yeah, I mean, I think we're absolutely capable of handling ourselves as far as with poachers go. I mean, we do it every day and, um, you know, we have the same equipment as local law, as the other law enforcement agencies. And um, so, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Wonderful. So that sort of leads us into our next question. Um, and I know that you in uh, undergraduate university, you had a career in law and justice. So this may have helped as well. But were you mentally prepared for the law enforcement side of the job? Was there any sort of initial trepidation or did that work itself out through academy? I mean, so I, when I went into college, I knew I wanted to go into law enforcement. There was absolutely no question about it. I wanted to go into law enforcement. Now, you know, obviously it got narrowed down to working for fish and wildlife and you know, there's always, you're always going to have some kind of thing, you know, something in the back of your mind that is going to be like, yes, this job is inherently dangerous. There are aspects of this job that you know, you know, I know when I contact people, as far as with hunting and fishing goes, almost every person's going to have a gun. Every person's going to have a knife, you know, that those are the things that we as, you know, with fish and wildlife, we understand. And I, you just have to be okay with going into those situations. You know, that doesn't mean I don't want to, you know, get shot today, but you understand the risks and this is the job I wanted to go into. I love, um, you know, I wouldn't see it any other way. And I know other law enforcement agency officers feel the exact same way that it's, it's something that they wanted to do and they understand, you understand what could happen. You don't want it to, but um, you kind of have to have that. And going through the academy, they really train you in a lot of the different situations you could be put in. Now with fish and wildlife, they don't exactly go through like our fish and wildlife contacts are a little bit different. Um, and so we kind of have our own thing, whereas you're trained for one thing, but realistically, if someone, you know, has a gun here, we're not like out hunting or fishing, we're not necessarily going to automatically pull our gun. It's, that's normal for us to deal with hunters or fishermen with guns or knives. It's, you know, a pretty simple, like, Hey, you don't touch yours. I don't touch mine. We call it good. And, uh, we both leave alive. Um, the website says that the requirement to be a WD, WDFW officer is two years of college or three years of military service. Do you happen to know, would three years of service in the National Guard count as well, or do I need to complete my six-year contract? Uh, I do not know those specifics. I don't do any of the recruitment stuff, um, but if you call our headquarters and talk with our recruitment um, guy, Dave Kalb, he'll be able to help answer any questions. Um, he's the guy that knows everything about recruitment. And I'm going to pop that link, um, the email into our chat right now. Okay. Okay. Our next question, are there any summer internship programs for 16 year olds? 
Do you have any suggestions on school prerequisites to take? Um, so the internship program that we had and that we're starting to, I believe they're going to try and do it this summer too. It just depends. Obviously we have COVID restrictions still going on. Um, but as far as with that internship goes, it was uh, for college, college age students. So not quite the 16 year olds. Um, just because they're more on their way, I guess, to like the career. Um, as far as like getting involved, um, there's different opportunities as far, as far as volunteer opportunities go, which would be great, especially if they work right alongside um, Fish and Wildlife. I know a lot, of the, a lot of the different clubs and stuff like Mule Deer Foundation, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, uh, Cascade Field and Stream here locally, Kittitas County Field and Stream, kind of the different clubs or, you know, places or different types of groups in your area, Audubon, they do stuff that closely goes along with fish and wildlife or does stuff for the habitat or the wildlife or birds and, um, so, or, and fish too. Um, so you can like Trout Unlimited. So you can definitely get involved with those groups in order to kind of gain a better understanding. And there's a possibility of working towards fish and wildlife um, or working with fish and wildlife. And then eventually if we're still, hopefully still doing the college um, internship program, then we can still, you know, if you get into that age, then go from there and hopefully get in that way. And um, as far as prerequisites go, I mean, biology is always a good um, start. I took biology, some biology in college. Obviously my, my stuff is heavily focused on the law and justice side of things. And then I took a lot of history, um, but that's just off of my personal preference. <laughs> and, um, you know, and then, I mean, getting outdoors and doing the different activities. I know that was one of the things um, that I've now started more doing as an officer. Like, um, so obviously I grew up big game hunting, but I never really went fishing. Well, I recently started going fishing more, you know, and then I just went on my first goose hunt and went and did that, you know, I enforced these rules, but never, you know, have done it before. And now I've started more doing it and it gives you that better understanding. So if you do it at an earlier age, you kind of have that more step ahead, I, I would say. When I was talking with other officers, they said if, if you're not participating in what you're enforcing, it's hard to understand what people can get away with. So right. that's, I think that's a really good point. Yeah. Um, in pursuing this career path, like what can prepare you for the oral panel uh, right now? Um, so definitely knowing fish and wildlife enforcement um, you know, knowing about the department is, um, is great. Obviously we work for the department as a whole, but understanding what, uh, DF WDFW enforcement is all about. And that's also on the webpage. Um, unfortunately I can't give a, too much away about the oral board. I sat on one last year and, um, just kind of understanding our, you know, rules, regulations, um, I wish I could say go on ride alongs right now, but we're still not doing them because of COVID. Um, but learning about the department, learning about enforcement, you know, seeing what we offer, what kind of um, abilities, you know, you can work on, you know, writing certainly is one of them. You know, people, people always say, oh, you have a great job. You get to drive around in the woods all day. I'm like, yeah. And then you get to sit in the office for like five hours working on reports because of all of the reports you took. And so writing is definitely a great skill to have. Um, it makes it easier when your sergeants have to review them, especially if they're criminal cases. And a lot of fish and wildlife laws are criminal violations. So they're really, it's really good to know that ability to write. Um, also communication skills. There's Anyway, like coming up in high school, like talk if there's speech or different writing classes, I would take them. Um, they're only going to make you better in this if this is the job you want to do. And obviously, having the passion. I mean, 
you can pretty you can go up to every officer in our department and be like oh why do you want to do this and you just we have that passion for our job and for protecting the natural resources when you don't have that passion it just you kind of lose it and you don't want to be proactive because that's definitely one of the things we have to be in our job i mean we get calls for service you know here and there but i mean we went all day yesterday working on a Sunday with no calls for service and you have three officers on and you're like, all right, well, got to drive around and talk to people, make contacts and, you know, see, see what's going on and dig up dirt, see what you got. And, you know, it's, it's a really proactive job. You have to have that drive to do it or you just won't find anything. And um, so that's one of the things you have to be willing to do. And, um, be okay with, be good with talking to people, especially because you do it a lot. <laughs> Not a job for introverts. <laughs> well, push yourself. I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of one, but I, I can, I'm good. I can be around people and talk and have conversations, but my personal life. Yeah, no, I'm definitely not. <laughs> Do you have any influence on where you work uh, or where you get posted to work? Um, so we pretty much have a list. So there's a list of what spots are open. Um, and from what I've, you know, they give you the opportunity, hey, what is your list? Like here out of all of these duty stations of where you're at of, that are available, what are your like top three? And they'll try, I mean, they'll try to send you there. Um, the thing is, is that a lot of, so those positions usually get opened up for laterals for uh, for within officers who are already in the agency to choose, they kind of pick and choose where they wanna go. I mean, after you get some seniority on, you can, um, it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty easy to relocate if there's spots open. Um, so yeah, you kind of have some say, but, realistically you have to be willing to go anywhere in the state that the department needs you um i don't even think i made a top three list they just i was told actually i was told by an officer while i was hunting that oh yeah you're going to ellensburg i'm like i haven't even been told that yet so <laughs> you know it's just uh, I'm like, well, which is fine because I went to college here and love uh, loved the county and everything. So I was like, okay, yeah, send me to Ellensburg. But so you have some kind of say just based off of what's available, you know, what spots are available at the time. How do you deal with frustrations around citations not being prohibitive against illegal activity? It seems hard to follow through some of the punitive action within the delayed court processes? Um, trying to think of how to. Um, so here in Kittitas County, we have uh, really good prosecutors. Our pro we work very closely with our prosecutors. Um, obviously, so when we issue like a citation or send in reports for criminal uh, for criminal violations, it's up to the judge. It's up to the prosecutors what they want to decide, what they decide to do. I mean, in some cases, they do. You know, for some criminal stuff, if you know, we can say, yeah, they can ask us follow up questions and be like, okay, so what's this about? What happened? You know, because our job is to lay out the facts. This is what happened. This is what we saw. This is what we heard. You know, this is our conversation with the suspect. And then we turn it over to the prosecutor and it is it is up to them. I mean, we don't, it does get a little bit defeating sometimes when you have cases that get dropped or reduced down severely into something that you're like, this is something that like probably shouldn't. And that's, kind of where like you just it's part of unfortunately it's part of the job I mean every law enforcement agency has that same 
I mean, you could ask probably every officer and they'll say, yeah, it gets a little defeating, but unfortunately we can't control it and you just got to move on and keep going. And, you know, it's never deterred what I do as a job. You know, if anything, it's made me really write kind of reports. So for fish and wildlife stuff, we often say we over have to over explain things, um, really show the importance because you know, when that prosecutor looks at your report and reads your narrative about what happened, showing that importance of why we have these rules and regulations can help out. I mean, showing the importance of why we have what we have and just explaining to them. And I know we've talked with our prosecutors here in the past, like, hey, let's come to, can we talk about, you know, how we, how you guys you know, reduce things down or kind of just see what we can do. Because a lot of our stuff for, especially for hunting, um, some of it wouldn't even, it would get dropped down, but it wouldn't even be a title 77, 15 violation. So we wouldn't be ever able to account it for like a suspension or something. And that's something that we got changed. And so like, even if a criminal, they do, you know, they're, work in the, what they do, what prosecutors do, if it gets reduced down to an infraction, it is at least something that we can count towards someone's suspension if it keeps happening. What college degrees would you recommend if you plan to pursue a career? Um, I mean, so I, I'm partial obviously to criminal justice, law and justice, just because I have that degree. Um, but also definitely biology. Um, I know, uh, you know, our local, some of our other officers that I work with have biology degrees and some form of conservation, stuff like that. Um, you know, it, it kind of, those are my, I guess my recommend, recommended ones. If you're going to go for like science, biology, definitely. Um, just learning about animals more different, you know, in fish and everything like that. Um, and then the law and justice side I come from just because I, you know, studied more of like police tactics type stuff. Like I did report writing in college and that's helped me greatly through my career so far. And, um, you know, just, I, it's, it's kind of varied because you don't, really it doesn't specify what degree you need but those ones will definitely help in kind of more of a background with uh, getting into this career what is something you wish you knew early in your career that you learned later on oh i don't even know <laughs> i'm i you know i learn new things every day like i you know you're not I don't know. It's starting out. I mean, I didn't half the time. I probably didn't know what to expect around the next corner and I still don't. I mean, it's, it's kind of a rewarding job and the fact that every day could be different and it's not always going to be the same. Um, you know, you could go to one fishing like pond one day and like two days later, it's going to be complete. It could be completely different. You'll have a different outcome. So I don't know if there's really anything that I wish I knew. Um, probably definitely, I guess, going and doing more of our outdoor activities than I uh, am now starting to get into. Definitely having more of that knowledge of what I'm enforcing earlier on in my career rather than like almost five years on and going goose hunting and more fishing for my first time in my life. So um, yeah, definitely that type of stuff. I mean, more of that getting out there and doing, doing the, doing what I'm enforcing. Thank you. You mentioned a lot of cool aspects of your job, but what does an average day look like? <laughs> um, so I kind of hit on that, uh, average day, um, could be different. I mean, I've had a, I've had days where I've been like set on what I was going to go do. And it like, 
right out the door, like turned into something completely different just on a one phone call. And, you know, so even if I try to plan out my day, it usually turns into, oh no, you're not doing this. Like, nope, you're going to go deal with, you know, we got a cougar call or we've got a bear call or we've got, you know, someone taking trout out of the Yakima River, which in our stretch of it is um, we're catch and release only. So we kind of, it kind of differs. I mean, we're kind of at a luxury. I mean, it's not really a luxury with our job, um, but we make our own schedules for the most part um, about before every month or at least two months in advance. I try to have my calendar on the board um, that we share with our other uh, co-workers or other officers in our detachment. You set your days off and then you, so we work 171 hours in a 28 day period, which um, equals out to an average of, what is it? 43 hours a week. Um, so just a little bit more than the uh, average day, um, an average work week. Um, but obviously that differs during different times of the season. Um, so like during, you know, deer or elk season, that's for uh, rifle, that's one of our biggest times of the year. That's the time when I could be working, I think I've worked 16 hours in one day. So pretty much dark to dark. And that's going around to different calls. Most, a lot of it's going around to different calls for service. You know, whether it's people self-reporting, you know, them saying, hey, I made a mistake, I'm turning myself in, or if it's people turning in other people for poaching or, you know, wastage or something like that. So the day-to-day kind of changes, especially based on the season. I mean, I spend a lot of time up in our Clockham wildlife area, um, which was one of the pictures um, on that pro- on the career profile. And I spend a lot of time up there during the hunting, during deer and elk season, and then just patrolling, trying to patrol different areas to contact people um, because we have some closed areas for deer that are open to right, right, or next to open areas. So we have those people that kind of blur that line or they just don't know and they just, or they just don't care. I mean, and they're just like, nah, I want to, I want a deer. I'm going to go do that you know, and then different times of the year, we have different priorities and, um, you know, obviously our weather kind of affects also where we can go. I mean, Kittitas County gets a lot of snow up in upper county. So up in the Cleelum, Easton area, Snoqualmie Pass, that gets a ton of snow. It limits, you know, where we can go. And so do the mountains with covered all up in snow. So, but that's why we have snowmobiles. So it's kind of nice because you can change up driving around in a truck all day or patrolling some bare lands or something. And um, like we have some elk closure or, you know, some of our wildlife areas are closed right now due to um, the, our elk wintering down low, like at Joe Watt. Um, coming up, we start having people, you know, going out and trying to go shed hunting and stuff like that. So we have to monitor that area as well. So it just kind of depends on the time of year. Time of year and then where you're located as well, because when you were in um, Bellingham or when you were in on the coast, you were doing really different things, right? Oh, well, I've never been on the coast. Oh, I thought you were on the coast. No, I've been in, uh, I've been in Ellensburg my whole, my whole time I've been with Fish and Wildlife. I've talked to officers who are on the coast and it sounds like they're doing very different things. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, on the coast, it differs completely than what we have, you know, ours are land and big game and some fishing stuff, but for the most part, like that's us. And then when you go to the coast, it's like fishing all the time. Some land, some, hunt, you know, and hunting too, but it's mostly fishing. So yeah, it definitely differs on therein like I couldn't probably tell you the difference between the rockfish species and they could just by like a brief glance and I'm like I'll have to look at the book (laughs) so wonderful well I think our last question for you is what is the best or what's your favorite part of the job 
Um, definitely being outdoors most of the time um, and interacting with all the all, with all the different people I get to meet. I mean, you get to talk to people from different backgrounds and kind of get to relate with them and talk with them, answer any questions, you know, and it's been, it's rewarding when I see kids who are coming up, you know, just getting started in hunting or fishing and they go, oh, this is my first time fishing. This is my first time I caught a fish. This is my first year. This is my first elk. And I'm like, this is the reminder of why I'm doing what I'm doing is this was the exact reason why I wanted to get into this job was for future generations to enjoy and being able to see them actually enjoying it and becoming and being really happy and successful is the best part. It's super rewarding. And um, I think we as officers, sergeants, captains, everyone, chief can all explain like, yes, we're all passionate about this. This is what we love and we genuinely enjoy it. And that's what's going to keep driving us to enforce these laws and make sure everyone can enjoy the outdoors responsibly. Courtney, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today and also for the work that you do. It's just so important and, and helping to inspire uh, folks to, to get into the, this line of work. Because I, I think it takes, you have to be tough and you have to be sturdy. And, and so I just, I know I really appreciate you and, and a lot of our, uh, our viewers and, and constituents really appreciate you as well. So um, for folks uh, who are still tuned in, I put a couple of links in the chat. So if you had any recruitment questions that didn't get answered, uh, you can email officerrecruitment at dfw.wa.gov. And then we also created, um, last week we published uh, sort of what different jobs look like around the state. It's sort of an interactive board that you can look at. Um, and there's some other profiles. So Courtney's story is unique from a lot of our other officers. And so you can see how other officers got in as well. Um, and I just wanna thank everyone so much for attending today. And I hope that you have a great rest of your day. And thanks, Courtney, it was great to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Thanks guys for joining us. And uh, it was a lot of fun. <laughs>